Um, right, so we have all these sort of weird looking instructions that, um, you know, are moving data to and fro, and then maybe at some point we have, uh, uh, we're going to different subroutines, and okay, there's some stuff with the stack. We need to kind of unpack all of these different things. So all of these different instructions, um, the ARM architecture is what's, what's called a load and store architecture in the sense that there's data in memory. There's also instructions in memory somewhere. And how do we manipulate data? Right, so if I want to like take a piece of data and add five to it or whatever, right? How do I do that? Okay, I first have to get that data into a register, and then once the data is in registers, then I can start to actually process with it. Okay, and then if I wanted to take the result and put it back out into memory, well, I would do that. Right, so it's sort of a, a Texas three-step, if you will load it from memory into a register, do something to it, and then write it back out into memory, okay? So the if we kind of broadly speaking categorize all of the different instructions that we're gonna have at our disposal, there's gonna be some instructions that involve moving data either from a register or to a register, okay? Um, there's gonna be a bunch of instructions that have to do with doing things with registers, okay? Uh, now, those of you guys who took 101 with me back in the day, right? You guys remember doing the Brookshire stuff? Yeah? How many instructions were there there in that language, roughly? Okay, it was uh, 10 or 12, I think, right? Not a whole lot, right? Uh, 12, yeah, it was 12, okay? Um, and, but as you guys saw, that was enough to do almost anything, right? Uh, so if, if we kind of split up the instructions here, okay, uh, in this example, these first two instructions are part of the moving data from memory to a register or v vice versa, okay? So storing a pair of registers, um, that's equivalent to storing them one at a time, um, but there's this nice instruction for storing pairs that kind of can speed it up a little bit. Um, and then also loading a register with a particular value, okay? We also have this pair down at the bottom, okay? And this may seem a little bit funny, but you'll get used to it. Um, so uh, the the instruction here on line 13, move W0 comma zero. Okay, so what does that do? W0, right, okay. So it moves the immediate value zero, okay? And I say immediate because um, it's, a, it's a fixed number that we've chosen. Right, so it's a specified value, not like the value of this variable that's sitting over here someplace. Um, we've taken the number zero and put it in register W zero, okay? Um, but over here, we've taken the address of a string, okay, so a pointer basically, right? And put it in register X zero. Okay, so there's two things, there's, well, several differences between those two instructions, okay? First off, what's the difference between W0 and X0? Not quite. So W0 and X0, yeah. Yeah, W0 is the, the lowest 32 bits of X0. So they're physically the same thing, okay? Um, they're not two separate registers. W0 is, like I said, the first, or sorry, the lowest 32 bits of X0, okay? Um, so there's one difference. 
the second difference is what we're loading into them. So this one we're loading in basically the address of something, a pointer, okay? And then in this example, we're loading in a specific number. Okay, so there's difference number two. And difference number three is the instruction. Okay, which instruction did we use to move a pointer? Oh, so that gives us the pointer. Yeah, LDR, load register. Okay, which instruction did we use to load an immediate? Move, not LDR. Okay, does that seem a little confusing? Maybe, right? Um, yeah, okay, so the two instructions are different names, right? They're two different instructions. Um, and uh, it, you guys will get used to it, but at, at least at, at one point you will make the mistake of trying to load an immediate value as opposed to moving an immediate value, whatever, okay? Um, I could also move um, one register's contents to another, okay? And move here is kind of a misnomer, right? So if I added in the instruction, I don't need this in this program, but let's just say that I did put it in. Oops. Okay, what would that do, do you think? Yeah, it's going to move whatever's in W0 to W1. Okay, what's in W0 after that instruction executes? Still zero, okay? So when we say move, um, we don't mean, like when you move a file on, a, on your desktop or something, what is that basically doing? Yeah, okay, if you move a file, you copy it to some new place and then you delete the original, right? Uh, so there's still only one copy of the thing anywhere. That's not what we mean by move here. Okay, so move in this case uh, preserves the value of the source. It just, so copy is really a, maybe a better name for it, but this is just the, the lingo, so sorry. Okay, um, Okay. so the other thing here, and, and so get used to this, um, notice that the, of the order that I put my operands here in. Who do I type first? the destination, and then the source goes after that, okay? So uh, with pretty much every instruction, the destination is going to go first. Um, not all of them. So for example, the store pair instruction, uh, the destination is technically at the end, right? Because it's something relative to the stack pointer. Um, so it's not 100% consistent, but basically the destination of any instruction is going to go first. And then the source uh, of that uh, data is going to come second. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so I don't actually need this instruction in this program, but yeah. Um, okay, so let's write a, um, let's write a new program here. And I'm going to just start by just copying some of this stuff. And um, Let's do some uh, let's do some arithmetic. Okay, so I'm going to delete these two things for now, and I'm going to scoot all of that stuff down so we've got some room here. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, line ten. Yes. Okay, so line ten and its sort of mirror image, line nineteen basically have to be the first and last lines of our program, okay, with the exception, obviously, of the return, okay? And what they're going to do is when the operating system hands control over to our program, what it's going to do is our program uh, is in control in the sense that the program counter, uh, which is a register, is equal to the first address that contains our program's code, okay? Now, 
for us to get back to whatever the operating system was doing before we started our program, we need to reset the program counter to what it was before we started our program. Okay, and uh, in order to do that, we need to record what was the uh, value of the program counter and the the memory, the the frame pointer, um, right as we were given control to our program. Those things are stored in X29 and X30. So X29 is the frame pointer. We'll talk a lot more about that later. Uh, basically, it's a memory kind of thing. Um, and X30 is the link register, which is uh, the last value of the program counter right before we jumped into our program. Okay. And then, in order, so we need to record those things. It's basically putting down the breadcrumb and the. Um, Hansel and Gretel kind of sense, okay? And then our program is gonna do a whole bunch of stuff and maybe we go to the other end of the room leaving a bunch of other breadcrumbs in the way and then we follow the breadcrumbs back to our first breadcrumb, which we pick up and we say, oh, I was, the operating system was over here doing whatever, right before we started doing our program, we need to, to basically recall that information so that when our program terminates it will go back to the correct place in the OS's code. Okay, does that make sense? So the the first and the last instruction is basically put down your breadcrumb right before you go into the forest and on your way out of the forest pick up that last breadcrumb. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. I think every program will. Yeah, okay. Um, and if there are other registers that we need to use for some reason, um, then, uh, so there are some registers that's, that programs are obligated to leave alone, okay, which means if you want to mess with them, you can. You just have to restore them to their original values right before you quit, okay? So, in more grandiose programs, we might have a bunch of these store instructions at the beginning and then a bunch of their mirror images down at the bottom. Uh, we don't in this case, but but we might theoretically, okay? It just depends on what our program is trying to do, okay? Uh, and the same thing is true for subroutines, okay? So if I want to write like, uh, like we wrote in C, okay, we wrote functions. Well, a function is what? It's really just a program in and of itself, and you transfer control to that function, the function does stuff, and then it comes back. So most, like if we want to really write a true function in the C sense, where you're passing data over to it, and then getting data back to it, uh, those functions are gonna look like this, in the sense that they're gonna have a, a breadcrumb dropped at the beginning, and a breadcrumb picked up at the end. Okay, and that'll be especially true if we're doing like recursion kind of stuff, uh, which we'll of course get to. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good question. So X29's purpose. Well, okay. There's two answers to that. In terms of the hardware, there's nothing special about X29 or X30, right? They are just registers. Why is it that we are using X29 and X30 for these purposes? Because that's the convention that uh, Linux in 64-bit on this hardware uses, okay? So we could have done this with X0 and X1 and just said, okay, those registers are gonna be the registers, but that's not the convention, okay? Um, and um, yeah. So it's partly a hardware thing, it's partly an OS thing. X30 is the link register, okay? That's the more important one for the purposes of um, following the breadcrumb trail back, okay? So the link register stores the value of the program counter just before your program started, okay? So the program counter, remember, what is that? Okay, it's a pointer to an, an address in memory that contains what? An instruction, okay? So think of it, the OS is, 
instruction, 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 instruction. Okay, bam, I'm about to run my program. So the, uh, the operating system is going to say, okay, I'm going to transfer control over to this instruction over here, and I'm going to write down in the link register the current value of the program counter so that when I jump over there, that program can write it down and then put it back. And so the, the, when this program terminates, the, the program counter resets to be whatever was in the link register, X30. Okay? So the link register is uh, really the breadcrumb uh, in the sense of, like, where did you come from? Okay? Uh, the X29, the frame pointer, uh, is more about memory management uh, than, uh, than in terms of, like, literally where were we in our code. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. So X29 and X30 are just, those are assigned to be the frame pointer and the link register respectively. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and, and we'll talk about this, the, the caller, callee conventions, right? We've got basically 32 general registers to work with. Okay. X29 and X30, we've sort of assigned these special purposes. X31 is also assigned a special purpose. It's either the stack pointer or all zeros, depending on the context. Um, and then that leaves us with basically register 0 up through 28. Right? And we can do with those essentially whatever we want, but there's a convention for which ones you're allowed to mess with and which ones you need to preserve, uh, meaning that if you mess with them, you need to return them to their original state, okay? So, um, you know, think of this in the sense of like, um, you know, let's say you're gonna, you're gonna make spaghetti, right? What do you gotta do? Well, you gotta get a pot out, maybe two pots, right? A big pot and a saucepan you got to boil the water, you got to put the pasta in, you got to drain the pasta, you got to deal with the sauce, right, and all of that stuff. Well, um, let's say you do this at, uh, at home. Your parents might be a little irritated if you don't clean up the mess after you're done, right? Okay, so there's certain registers that you're obligated to clean up and return to their original state before you're finished. And then there are other ones that uh, that you are not obligated to do so, um, which, yeah, I guess doesn't really match the dish analogy, but you you get the point, right? So I, don't, I don't only have to do some dishes? Yes, you only have to do some dishes. That's the, yeah. <laughs> you only have to do the, the dishes, uh, you don't have to do the X0 through X7 dishes, okay? Um, yeah. Uh, or I guess those of you in fraternities, right, don't have to do any dishes because you can just make the pledges do them, right? Not true. Oh, but yeah, right, because you guys don't have pledges. You have associates. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, well, that seems fitting. Um, yeah, so. Okay, so what kind of stuff can we do? Like, let's think about... Um, like, think about in C or Python or, or really whatever language, right? What makes these programming languages complete? Okay, and I use complete in two senses. Well, you guys speak English, and so you know what the word complete means, right? Okay. Uh, but then I also use it in a technical sense of complete in the sense of Turing completeness. Okay, is anybody in theory of computing with ML this semester? No. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so there is a technical definition here to what I mean by complete, but for right now, let's just take this as, you guys aren't idiots, you know what the word complete means, okay? Um, so what makes a language complete? What are the pieces that we need, what are the things we need to be able to do in C or Python or whatever, right? What are the basic building blocks that every language has got to have in some way, shape, or form? Yeah. Okay. 
So that's like function type stuff. What else? What other, what primitive building blocks do we build our functions out of? Or, or programs out of, excuse me. Okay, in C we have to call it main, but in any language really there is a main function, right, and then you can have subfunctions. Functions, what else? Yeah, okay, some sort of data types, okay, and, and this is one of the things about Python that I guess makes you guys, um, uh, like, do, do you have to declare data types in Python? If you say x equals 5 and y equals 3.7 and then you add x and y, is Python like, yeah, sure, bro, no problem. Okay, uh, yeah, if you do that in C, what's the issue? You can't add an int and a float. Right, they're two different data types. I mean, you can, but you have to convert one to the other first. Okay, so some sort of primitive data types, and in Python, those are kind of the the primitive part of it is hidden from you. That's one of the things that makes Python both good as a beginner language, but also dangerous because it it encourages, um, well, it kind of hides some of the important details from you. Okay, so what else? Programming languages. Come on, guys. Huh? Okay, but that's kind of ask. That's kind of defining a program as a program, right? All programs are algorithms in a sense. Think, think more basic than that. Huh? Okay, math. Conditionals and loops, right? Not much of a programming language if you can't say if x then y and uh, then uh, if you can't just say, hey, do this thing 10,000 times, I don't want to type that instruction 10,000 times, right? Okay, so these are kind of important, right? Uh, math certainly is important, okay? And, and I'll add here to math, let's say not just mathematical things, but also logical, okay? Uh, in the sense that, like, can I do Boolean operations like and or not, those sorts of things, XOR, whatever. All right, so uh, logical shifts, arithmetic shifts, right, all of those kinds of, of instructions. But fundamentally, what makes a programming language complete is the fact that we have conditionals, okay? And as we'll see, loops really are just a fancy use of conditionals. But the conditionals are the most primitive and most important thing, okay? Um, okay, so... We have to know how then to do arithmetic, and therefore, uh, and that will feed into how we do conditionals, okay? So, how do we do arithmetic? Let's start with that. So, let me just, for sake of example, oops. Um, and for reasons that will become clear in a moment, I'm putting these in registers two and three. Okay, so this set of instructions, what do we think that's going to do? W1? Hmm. It's a register. Okay, so well, what's the instruction on line 12 going to do? Destinations W2, and what's going into it? Oh, and I didn't have to put the hash mark. Sorry, that's a habit, bad habit. Uh, 6502 assembly. Oops, and let me go ahead and save this real quick. Sorry. Oops.
Okay, so uh, line 12, what is that going to do? Take the number 2 as an integer and put it in W2. Okay, what's the line in 13 going to do? Same thing, uh, W3 is now going to have the value of 3 in it. Okay, and then what is instruction number 14 going to do? Right. So it's going to take whatever's in W2 and W3, add them together, and put the answer in W1. Okay. So like I said earlier, uh, for most of these instructions, the destination is listed first. Uh, ah, okay. Good question. Right. There's two answers to that. I already have declared that it's an integer. Oh, yeah, well. But it doesn't look like I declared it. How do you know that I'm working with integers? Well, 2 and 3 happen to be integers. But how do you know that I'm not working with 2.0 and 3.0 as floats? Hmm? Yeah, Cade. Uh, no, ASCII is text encoding. Okay. The, uh, well, okay. In my ASCII string, I have percent %i, right, which means that whenever I get to the point of printing, I know I need to have an integer. But I haven't printed anything yet, so that string is, as of right this instant, useless. Bing, bing, bing. Well, sort of. Okay, you, you, you almost had it. What's the difference between W2 and X2, or really a W register and an X register? Okay, but they're both integers. Okay, the general purpose registers are integer registers. If I wanted to do floating points, I have to use a totally different set of registers, the S's and D's. Okay, so the uh, addition here that instruction with either W or X's means integer addition. Okay, if I wanted to do floating point arithmetic, and, and we totally can, right, I would have to use a different set of registers that are d dedicated to floating point work, and I would also have to use the floating point version of add, which is called F add for float add, right? It's a fad. Yes. That is a fantastic question. No. Well, okay. The, the, sort of. Uh, <laughs> there are because we could either have a W or an X, right? W is 32 bit. Okay. So good question, right? Um, th that's actually a really good question. So what's the biggest number that we can load in as an immediate with the move instruction? Well, let's think about that, okay? A W register holds 32 bits worth of stuff, okay? So what's the biggest 32-bit integer that you can write down? 2 to the 32 minus 1, okay, because you have to, you have to spend an encoding on 0, okay? All right, so how many bits does it take to express that number, though, 2 to the 32 minus 1? Well, 32, right? The bit pattern would be 32 ones all in a row. Okay, good. Um, but let's take a step back here. How long is each instruction in this architecture's machine code? Huh? Every instruction, every single one, with Asterisks, there are some exceptions. Um, the instructions are all how wide? Well, where could we go to figure this out? Like how many bits does it take to store a single instruction? I'm sorry? We could go to the debugger. Or what about the listing files? This is the whole point of generating those. Okay. 
the listing file, so let's just go to, let's take our listing file from last time. <clears throat> Okay, I never made an a, a listing file last time, so let's just make one real quick. Okay, so now I've got the listing file, hello.list. This is the yes, because that tells it to make a listing file. Oh, well then I don't remember what dash A does. I haven't had coffee yet. Okay, so here's our listing file. All right, how do we read these things? Uh, there's three columns worth of a bunch of stuff. Well, really four columns, right? The far left column is the line number. The second column is a memory offset from the start of the program. Okay, and the third column is the instruction encoding. Well, what do you notice? They're all 32-bit, every last one of them. Okay, now let's contrast that. Well, okay, so let, let's go back to Cole's question. <clears throat> hmm? Well, yeah, so eight, eight, uh, eight, each hex character represents a nibble of four bits. Okay, so the uh, if each instruction is 32 bits wide, can I use a 32-bit immediate as part of an instruction? No. Okay, but right. Okay, so I've got 32 bits, right, and I have to spend some of it to encode what the actual operation is. I also have to spend some of it to encode, well, like say for example here, let's look at the move W00, right? So what all do I need to encode in the 32 bits that I have at my disposal? I need to encode that it is a move instruction. Okay, that's gonna take some number of bits. I need to encode that W0 is the destination for this move. That's gonna take some number of bits. And I need to encode the number zero that I'm actually moving. Okay, now, if I'm going to spend some bits to, to encode the fact that this is a move and some other bits to, to spend on it being W0 is where I want that number to go, can I encode a 32-bit immediate value? No. Okay, I can only encode some lesser number of bits. Okay. Now, this means that if you do want to use a value that's larger than that, you have to do something funny and careful, okay? Um, now, let's actually go in, and so there's a real way we can answer this question, uh, is we'd have to look at, okay, in the, the you remember the like 4,000 page PDF? That, that I pulled up, I think, last time, right? Okay, uh, yeah, what we would have to do then is go into that 4,000-page PDF and see how many bits does it take to say it's a move instruction and how many do we need to spend to say that it's W0, et cetera, okay? And then we'd be able to better answer that question, okay? So we'll come back to that because that, that is really important, okay? Now, um, for sake of completeness here, let's contrast this what happened if we if you loaded um, your hello world listing file when you guys did the Intel uh, assemble uh, the Intel conversion? What did you notice about the instruction links there? They're different sizes, okay? There, or maybe another way to say that is the length of an instruction on the Intel architecture is variable, okay, and that's both a good and a bad thing, okay? Because it's good in the sense that we don't have to necessarily fit ourselves into a predefined bit length for each instruction, okay?
Okay, so if, for example, I wanted to load in a 32-bit immediate value, a really big one, I could do that because I could have my move instruction and then however many bits I need to, to describe what it is I'm moving in, no problem. Okay, what's the downside to having all these instructions having different lengths? More complex. Than, like, and just say that the PPP is only developed for a particular like, like, like IP based application. Well, partly, yeah, that, that's... Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Yeah, it's a more complex instruction set, okay? Which means that instruction decoding and loading in instructions and stuff, you can't just load in automatically 32 bits at a time. You kind of have to decode it as you go to determine are you done loading in or if you hit the end of the instruction yet, okay? Um, so there's trade-offs to this, right? Uh, now, it is certainly true about Intel architecture, although this is not, um, this isn't the reason, that uh, as the Intel architecture has matured, right, because when, when did, when we say Intel architecture, what do we mean? Okay, what, did, what was Intel's first real commercial chip? Well, the i7s. No, it was the Intel 4004, okay? And it was designed uh, basically in partnership with a Japanese calculator company, and it was going to be the processor inside a uh, line of calculators that this company was going to produce, okay? And they, uh, this was later followed up with the 8008, and then the 8086, and then the 8080, uh, which are very, very closely related. But what Intel did with its architecture, okay, and you guys are too young to really have experienced this. Um, so the 40 odd four, we're talking like early 70s. Okay, so this is old school stuff, real old school. You flash forward to say the, um, the late 70s, early 80s, okay? And the 8086 and 8088 um, families, right, then they made enhancements to them, okay? And they released this as this new chip called the 8186. And then there was the 8286, and the 8386, and 486, and then they switched over to Pentium, even though uh, in technical senses they still call it a 586 uh, in many, in it, and so on. Okay, so uh, if you're Intel and you got a bunch of customers that are used to having uh, 8086s or whatever, right? And these things, what machines were they powering? Well, for example, the IBM PC from the mid 80s or early 80s and all of its sort of uh, subsequent uh, um, models. Well, okay, so we, we kind of need to go back here. If it's 1984 and you want to go buy a computer, what choices do you have? Let me change the question. <clears throat> it's today. You have a Fiji's dad's credit card and you want to buy a computer. What choices do you have? Well, yes, right, you can buy whatever you want, but like really what choices do you have? Yeah. Okay, you can buy an Intel architecture or AMD, but they're really kind of similar, right? And on that run Windows or Mac, I mean uh, uh, Linux, sorry. Or you can drive to the Apple store and you can buy an apple. Right. Are there really any other options here for personal computer, right? Could you build your own? Well, okay, but what's the difference between building your own desktop and this laptop that's sitting in front of you? Oh, it's going to be way better. But fundamentally, they're both still Intel architecture. which is what Apple did, right? <laughs> well, sort of, they licensed one, but 
Uh, okay, so you have two choices. You can go out and you can buy a, an Apple, which is actually ARM architecture, because Apple licensed the ARM architecture, and they've designed their own chips around the architecture. Okay? Uh, nobody said you could go out and buy a Raspberry Pi. Maybe that was too obvious. Okay, so maybe there's a third choice. But are you going to be playing Crisis on your uh, Raspi? No, okay. Uh, maybe at like negative two frames per second. It's like it'll be so slow it's actually running backwards. Um, yeah, okay. So you have two choices, right, basically. Intel, and within that it's Intel or AMD, but they're basically still Intel, okay, or ARM. Uh, Max. Uh, well, not all Max. Uh, so the MacBook Pros, 13-inch MacBook Pros, 13-inch MacBook Airs, Mac Minis, and the newest uh, iMacs all run M1 chips, which are ARM architecture, along with every one of Apple's mobile devices. So all the phones, not, well, 16-inch, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the newer models of those, there are no ARM ones of those yet. Apple's in the process of transitioning their entire product line to, uh, to ARM, okay? Which for them is gonna be really nice because it means literally every device that they make from your watch all the way up to your Mac Pro are all using the same architecture, okay? That makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah, but but it's just what processors under the hood, what architecture, okay? In the 80s, there were a lot more choices, right? You could get something that had a Z80 in it. You could get something that had an Intel 8080 in it. You could get something that had an MOS 6502 in it, <clears throat> okay? And there were a lot more different companies making these things, right? You could go buy an Atari computer. You could go buy a Commodore computer. You could go buy an Apple computer. You could get an IBM computer. You could get one of the IBM clones. You could get, right? So there were a lot more choices back then. Um, and, you know, think of it if you're in a competitive market, right? And processor technology, you know, the development of this is super fast scale, right? It's super uh, fast. If you just sold a company a whole bunch of 8086s, and then you come up with an 8286, and you want to sell them a whole bunch of those new machines, they're going to be kind of pissed if none of their old software works anymore, wouldn't they? Okay? And so that's one of the brilliances, if you will, of what Intel did, um, is by making its architectures basically backwards compatible, right? So when you boot up one of these machines, it starts in legacy mode, the same way that an Intel chip would have started in the 70s. Okay, and then it, you know, opens up all the expansions, right, to deal with 64-bit stuff and all these added instructions and all of this complexity. Okay, so that's nice in the sense that it's backwards compatible. You can still run code from, you know, the 70s, essentially. Okay, uh, the downside, though, is it means that the architecture just has a bunch of but it has lots of baggage, okay? Um, and this is why, for example, if you took a very well-equipped Intel computer, okay, uh, or say an Intel Mac, and you take a very well-equipped M1 Mac, the M1 Mac can emulate, which means simulated software, the x86 Mac faster than the x86 Macs can do it natively. That's ridiculous. Okay. And just kind of shows you, I think, why Intel, that architecture has kind of hit an evolutionary dead end. You, it, at some point, you can't just keep tacking more shit on it. Right. The more duct tape you add, eventually you just have a giant ball of duct tape. Okay. Sometimes it's better to just throw the whole thing out and start clean sheet and make something from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, so that's the thing. I, I'm not sure Intel will die out, right? But what it means is that they're going to face a real competitive pressure to innovate. Um, and we'll see how they choose to innovate. I mean, Intel is not the only processor architecture out there besides ARM. There are others. There's RISC-V, there's MIPS, there's, you know, there, there are other architectures out there in the world. Um, maybe, well, actually in the 90s, Intel tried to make a clean sheet 32-bit um, and 64-bit architecture called Itanium. Um, it was a horrible flop, okay? Not because it was 64 bits, but because it was a piece of crap, um, you know. So anyway, um, I know I've kind of gone on a tangent here, but uh, these are sort, sort of the, the upsides and downsides of any instruction uh, set. Width of instructions, backwards compatibility, etc. Okay, so for us, Yes, it is a downside that we can't encode a 32-bit immediate value. We have to do something else, okay? Uh, we could encode it in memory and then just load it from memory. That's one solution. Uh, the other is to sort of build it by doing a success a series of instructions. We'll talk more about that later with uh, move K, move in, and move Z uh, at some point. Okay. Um, but let's get back to um, where were we, right? So this math and stuff, right? Okay, so what should be the value in register W1 after this instruction completes? Five, okay? And let's say that I want to print that. Okay, what else do I need? I need to put the string... Okay, and I still call it hello string here, but whatever, the name isn't really important. Okay, I need to load x0 with the address of the format string. Okay, and let's look at our format string. What is our format string? The number is, that's just text, whatever, percent %i. Okay, what that means is I want to print an integer, a 32-bit integer, no less, okay? So where do 32-bit integers have to be in terms of the registers? They have to be in Ws, okay? If I wanted a 64-bit long integer, what would I have to change here? Instead of I, percent I, I would have to make it Li for long integer, okay, so 64-bit. Okay, and I would also have to change the W's to X's, right, because those are the 64-bit versions, okay? Uh, okay, so there's that. Um, if we were to print this in C, what would I have typed, okay? So the equivalent C expression here would have been something like um, uh, let's see, what, it would have been um, well, the format string. And then what would I have I've done? Yeah, or something, right? I would put the number there. Okay, so I need to pass, so let's just say I wanted to print 5. That's how I would do it in C. Okay? Okay. Uh, no, but... Yeah, you're right. I, I would say something like uh, var1 plus var2, say, okay? And and say var1 is 2 and var3 is 3 or whatever, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the assembler will ignore anything that comes after a uh, double. Uh, so you can do commenting and assembly the same way you would um, um, in uh, C or whatever, okay? All right, but... So my point, though, is what do you need to pass to print F? Well, I'm passing two things here. The string and the integer, right? So I need to pass printf a format string and the integer that it's going to plop in place of that percent %i, okay? Could we print more stuff? 
So could I print three integers if I wanted? Sure, right? In this case, I did my example, I only want to print one of them. Okay, so here's the convention. You pass parameters in the uh, in this order. Okay, so there are four sets of registers. Okay, what's the difference here? There's the int side and the float side. Okay, and they go in order. Okay, so what's the first thing that I have to pass to print f? Address of a format string. What kind of data is that? What is the address of a format string? What kind of data is that? Okay, so let me write it this way. Uh, let's say, so pointer to a string. Pointer to string is going to be in one of those four things. Which one is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so which one, X or W? 64-bit architecture. Okay, so the pointer to the string goes in X0. What's the second thing that I pass to printf? The value of whatever number. Okay, what register does that have to go into? Well, it depends, okay? So let's just say I'm printing the number 5, which was the result of doing our addition, okay? Uh, 5 is what kind of number in this case? It's an integer, so it's a 32-bit integer. So where is it going to go? W1. If I wanted to print subsequent numbers, let's say I wanted to print this number 5 six times, where would the second 5 go? The next W, the next W, the next W, the next W, and they go in order, right? So when you type printf parentheses something comma something comma something comma something, they go in this order. The format strings address goes in X0, the next thing goes in something sub 1, the next thing in something sub 2, and so on, okay? Could be. Yes. Okay. Uh, it, well, uh, <clears throat> on either the XW side or the SD side. So let's say I wanted to print a float. I would have the address string in X0 and the float in D0. Okay, which I know sounds a little confusing, but it's because you never put addresses in the D register, so you can. there's no sense in wasting that first one. Okay, so there's that order that you want to print, uh, that you have to pass parameters in, okay? So now, do you guys see why it is that I set up my addition so that the answer ended up in W1? Because I knew it had to be there eventually, right? I'm the guy who's playing chess five moves ahead. You guys are still playing checkers. Okay, or that, that stupid triangle game with the pegs at, at uh, Cracker Barrel. <laughs> yeah? Huh? Have you ever been to Cracker Barrel? Oh, that's right. You guys did, yeah. Did you take him to Cracker Barrel so he'd, he would at least know what it was? Yeah, I was going to say, and no offense, but uh, I don't know if I'd go to the Crawfordsville Cracker Barrel with your skin color. Okay, <laughs> might uh, might not. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a sad reality. But uh, okay, how did we get on the Cracker Barrel thing? Oh, chess and checkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I do do love. How many of you guys? Does anybody have the giant checker set that they sell at Cracker Barrel with the big like? Carpet, basically sized chess. I mean, checkers board. No, that was like my favorite thing as a kid. Yeah, the gift shop. So, okay. Anyway, um, so uh, so now you guys see why it was that I made sure that the answer ended up in W one. 
okay, because I was planning ahead. Now, let's say I had been a dumbass and not done that. What would I have needed to do? So, like, let's say that I had, had put 2 in W0, 3 in W1, and the, and the addition in W2. That's fine for doing the arithmetic, but for the printing, where does the W2, or where does the number 5 need to be? It's got to be in W1, okay, because of our calling convention, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, so I just uh, I chose the register numbers the way I did so as to save time, basically. Is this weird? I will be in the next video that comes like after all those. Why does why is the next one like W one zero two and then X three? Ah, that's not the convention. Okay, and it's it's more about what order do I have to pass the things to printf? Who's got to go first with printf? The format string, always the format string. Okay. Now, I could have loaded X0 with the address of the format string back at the top of the program, right? Because none of the other lines, did they do anything with the W or X0 register? No, so I could have done that first, but uh, I just chose to do it down here, okay? All right, so now I want to print something, okay? And this gets to, starts to get to our other thing. Okay. Yes. No. So, like, let's say that you wanted to. Well, let's say that I wanted to do this. Let's say I want to print two numbers. Okay. And let's just say I want to print 5 and 1832. Whatever, I'm just making something up. Okay. What order do things have to go in? What's the very first thing I pass to print F? The address of the format string. Every time. Okay. What's the second thing I'm passing to print F? The number 5. What's the third thing I'm passing to print F? The number 1832. Okay, so the format string's address has to go in which register? X0. Okay, because it's a 64-bit thing, and it's the first thing. Okay, the number 5 needs to be in which register? W1. And the number 1832 would need to be in W2 or X2, but... Um, w2 in this case because I'm treating 1832 as a 32-bit int, not a 64-bit int. Okay, I could do 64-bit ints, but yeah. Okay, so, uh, it, well, it, it'd be x3 in that case. So what, where do I need to put, um, what do I need to put in um, uh, w2? Okay, 1832, and then it's going to print that. Okay. All right, so they go in that order, right? Uh, now, you ask, what happens if you want to print more than seven things? Give up. <laughs> That's such a cold answer, right? <sighs> Just switch, fail. Switch majors. Sw yeah. <laughs> this is kind of like... Um, uh, you know, when, when you were a kid and you learned how to multiply two-digit numbers by two-digit numbers, and then there's like, you're going to multiply three-digit numbers by three-digit numbers. Ooh. Yeah. So actually, you know what? When I was in elementary school, I mean, I was, I was good at math, but I didn't really like it. Okay. And why? Why would I have not liked math in elementary school? No. <laughs> I have missed our verbal spars from last year.
Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> because it was all like tedious, boring arithmetic. Like, yeah, long division's great and all, but like, seriously, like, how many times do I have to sit there and do freaking long division? All right? I don't like, I didn't like that stuff because I was destined to be a mathematician, not an accountant. Okay? So, for me, the single most glorious day of mathematics was when the alphabet entered the picture. And there was abstraction. Right? Like, uh, or even in elementary school, I mean, how many of you guys remember the worksheets where it'd be like three plus box equals five? What is box? And you'd have to kind of learn how to think backwards, mm -hmm. right? That was, that's mathematics. The rest of it's just tedium. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so yes, when, when algebra, when I was first exposed to algebra, it was like, you know, angels singing and the clouds parting and there's like rays of sunshine coming down from heaven. Oh, I would crush them. Well, the, the winning part was fun, but the, the doing, doing the nitty gritty arithmetic was, was less fun. So anyway, uh, okay. So let's, uh, let's assemble and run this thing and see what happens. Okay. So, um, there's one other instruction here that we're kind of going to, uh, uh, that we've kind of used here. This is actually a conditional instruction, but it's an unconditional conditional, okay? So a conditional would be something like if X, then Y. Well, what about if I do something like if true, then blah? Well, true is always true, right? So then the thing would always get executed, okay? So the B here stands for branch, okay? And that's going to be our code for conditional expressions or jump type things. Basically, what the branch does is it's going to change the value of the program counter to something else if a condition is true. Now, in the case of BL, this is branch and link, it's an unconditional. It will always do it if you hit that instruction. As opposed to, and we'll look at these later, conditional jumps where you first have to say, okay, are two things equal or not equal or is one less than the other or whatever, right? The kinds of things that you would do in a loop, right? Or not in a loop, uh, a, um, a conditional thing. So if we think about, for example, assignment four, or no, three, uh, what did you guys do there, right? It was the user had to input one or the number one or two. And if it was one, you did one thing. And if it was two, you did another. And if it was something else, you re-prompted them for a valid input. Okay? But you were deciding, based on the value of some variable, is it equal to one or two or whatever? Right? And then you did something accordingly. Okay? All of those will be handled with B-type instructions, B for branch. Okay? And so it'll be B with some decorations. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about all those decorations later. In this case, though, um, we're branching to the function printf, right, which is part of the C standard library, and we definitely want to do that, okay? And then the L, the link part, that's what's important because what that does is leave a breadcrumb trail, okay, uh, so that the program will come back to uh, the next line, which in this case is the move w00 thing. Okay, all right, so let's assemble this and get in GDB and see what we got going on. All right, so let's do Oops, sorry. We only use that with the compiling side. Okay, so I've assembled it with the debugging stuff. I've linked it to all the C standard library stuff and done so statically because uh, GDB is happier that way. But if I just run it real quick, there we go. Okay, all right, but 
what I really want to do okay is let's look at the instructions okay so let me step through um, okay and let's look at what do we have in the registers x0, x1, x2, and x3. What's in x1? 5. Okay, it's really in w1, but w1, remember, is the lowest 32 bits of x1. Okay, so in some sense, they're the same thing. Okay, uh, what's in register 2? Two? 2. What's in register 3? Three, okay, and so what did I, what were the instructions that I've just executed? I loaded a register with the value two. I loaded another one with three. I added them and put it in W1. And look, there it is. Right? Okay. Uh, all right, so what's about to happen next? Uh, almost. Okay. 1832. And I'm about to print. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, registers. What's in X0? Oh, God. Okay. Nope. What's got to be in X0, damn it? The address of the format string. So where is the format string in memory? It starts at location number 483028. Okay, that's where the string is, or the format string anyway. Okay, what's in register W0? 5. What's in register W2, or uh, sorry, not W0, W1? 5. What's in register W2? 1832. Okay, so the display here, right, is that the middle column is the value in hex, and the right-hand column is the value decoded as a signed integer. Okay, um, and uh, okay, great. So what's going to happen now if I hit step one more time? Okay, it just printed, and what's the instruction that's about to get executed? The put zero in W zero. Okay, so... You guys, the printing has just happened, right? We branched to printf, it did its thing, and now we're back. Let's look at the registers now. It does. It wipes it, okay? Because guess what set of dishes you don't have to do? X0 through X7, okay? So printf needs to use registers in its own functioning, okay? But it is of no obligation to return all of them to the original state. It doesn't have to do all of the dishes. Okay. And so when we come back from printf, what's in registers x0, x1, x2, and so on? Yeah, so we just came back from printf, and what's in all these registers now? Garbage. Right? Is that what they started as? No. Okay. So... The number 5 or the number 1832, if we want to reuse those, they're gone. So what would we have to do if we wanted to preserve those values after the printing happens? We would need to save them into memory someplace, okay, which we didn't do. Okay, so after the print instruction executes, What's in the registers, uh, most of them, gets all jacked up. And so if we needed those values, 5, 18, 32, or whatever, okay, we're going to need to save them somehow to use them later. Okay, so you guys see the issue? Sort of? Okay. Um, but what instruction, we're almost done with this program, right? What instruction is about to execute? It should put 0 and W0, and, and there it is.
okay? And then we're about to quit, right? Pick up your last breadcrumb and hit the leave, leave the room. Which is perfect because speaking of leaving the room, it's 9.15, okay? Yeah, so, all right. So is this starting to kind of sink in a little bit? Yeah, okay. All right, I'll come up with some diabolical assignment. Um, oh, and just one reminder, um, next week, when do we have class? Just Tuesday. Why don't we have class on Thursday? Fall break. Okay, so our fall break is Thursday and Friday of next week. Okay, so no, we don't have class Thursday next week. Good? All right.